Chapter 23 So much work to do. Namo had to find food, build a shelter, dig a garden, cut down a tree, and carve it into, a, into the shape of Crocodile Guts's boat. The boat and garden would have to wait. Even the shelter was less important than an immediate food supply. She didn't dare use her stores from the Juzu Island until she was certain she could replace them. And before I continue, please smash that like button. And if you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. I would appreciate it. The rainy season was past, and so therefore was the, was the largest supply of vegetables. Still on the stony slopes of hills, she found many small Tazenza bushes. Their roots could be roasted like yams or even eaten raw if she was really hungry. In the marshy ground where the stream met the lake, she found dense patches of sedge. The small brown tubers under the soil would be available throughout the dry season. Wild spinach, moa, was still present, although sparse, and several varieties of wild beans had escaped foraging baboons. The beans were dry, but she could soak them. On termite mounds, Namho discovered jabvain, jabvain bushes with purplish black fruit and in, and in dense thickets near the water grew brambles with dark sweet berries. She found wild laquats and waterberries, monkey oranges and marula. All had been plundered by baboons, but quite a lot of food was, was left. Namho noticed that some trees were hardly touched, and when she tasted the fruit, she understood why. The animals had so much to eat, they could afford to ignore food that tended to be sour. Later in the dry season, they wouldn't be as fussy. Namho collected a basket of the pale yellow marulas from the ground and returned to her cook fire. In the middle of each fruit was a nut that, broken open, produced three edible seeds. Namho craved oil so she ate the seeds right away. Some of the white, pulpy fruit she also devoured, and some she boiled to make a drink for later. She found a number of large grasshoppers, pulled off the heads to remove the guts, and roasted them on a flat stone over the fire. She tossed them in a basket to knock off the wings and legs. In the afternoon, Namho harvested gourds to turn into calabashes and storage pots. She cut slashes in muto, mutoa trees and collected a ball of sticky, sticky sap. She hacked off the outer shell of a mupfuti tree and began peeling off long strips of the inner bark. By sundown, Namho was exhausted. She lay in the mouth of the cave and wearily chewed and twisted the bark strips into twine. The bark tasted good, like raw beans and gave her the illusion that she was eating as well as working. The cries of the baboon echoed in the, in the trees across the grasslands, but they didn't attempt to approach the cliff. In the middle of the night, the unknown creature came out of its hiding place and whisked its long antenna over Namho's legs. Day after day, Namho toiled. She smeared bushes with the sticky mutua, mutua sap and baited it with termites. In the evening, she harvested small birds, which she gutted and wrapped in clay and baked in coals. When the clay cracked, she pulled it off along with the feathers and devoured the small morsels inside. She installed fish traps in the streams and set twine snares along small game trails. She caught cane rats, squirrels, and hares. That's spelled H-A-R-E-S, heirs. Every day she spent as much time as possible constructing a platform in the lucky bean branches. Namho cut down small, straight trees. She worked very carefully because she didn't dare damage the panga. She hauled the poles up into the lucky beans with crocodile guts' rope and experimented with various configurations until she had a floor that was more or less level. She bound the poles together with twine. Next, she covered the platform with a thick layer of thatching grass. It was beautiful. Namho lay back on the springy grass with a sigh of satisfaction. No more cold, lumpy sand. No more feeling cramped like a worm in a nut. 
she began to plan all sorts of refinements, upper platform to store food, a rope ladder, a barrier of thorn bushes, a thatched roof to keep out the rain. Rain? Namho stopped in horror. The rainy season was months away. She would have to be away long before it began. When the violet, violent storms arrived, the waves on the lake would become extremely dangerous. Namho looked up through the dark, fan-shaped leaves at patches of bright sky. As long as she kept busy, she could tr thrust away thoughts of her real predicament. Now they rushed back. She was alone on this island, now and forever. She would slowly grow old without family or children until she was too feeble to climb the tree. Her eyes would grow too dim to find water and her fingers too weak to dig for yams. She would starve like the baboon on the little island unless a predator found her first. No, I will build a boat and sail away, Namho crowd stoutly. stoutly. I am Namho, Dongwi, whose totem is the lion and whose people are descended from kings. I am a woman, not a little girl. I have a mother and crocodile guts for company and, and the juzu. The juzu still made her uneasy. For a moment, she saw them gliding out of their huts with Aunt Shuvai's beads twined around their long bodies. She climbed down the notches she made in the lucky bean trees and went to and went back to the boat. She had already ringbarked a thick mukua tree to cut down later. She wandered to the tip of the large island and got a surprise. The water level had dropped during the night. And I'm going to read a little note that Nancy Farmer has here. When the floodgates at Kabora Basa Dam are opened, the water level drops sharply. And if you're listening to this somewhere other than YouTube, um, my, my, my email, not my email, my domain name is mrwordcrush.com. And you can go to that and see more of my videos. It's all on YouTube right now. If you have a suggestion on, on another platform I should be at, let me know. And I'll keep reading. Even she could jump from rock to rock to the little island now. The, bo the baboon must have escaped, she thought, but when Namho shaded her eyes, she could still see him crouched under a tree. He watched her duly. She threw a stone to get his attention, but he didn't react. It's not my prob problem, Namho declared, returning to her campsite. She moved everything to the platform and began working on her ladder. Once upon a time, there was a wealthy man and wife with only one daughter. Namho said as she alternatively twisted and chewed the moop futi bark into rope. She had calabashes of water and boiled marula juice, a pot of toasted grasshoppers, a basket of sinza roots, and a small grass mat covered with ripe bramble be brambleberries. Higgly piggly in the branches were wedged baskets of supplies. On a corner of the platform, protected on two sides by branches, was Mother's picture, weighed, weighed it down with stones. Namho had to guard the picture carefully because, she, because the paper was tempting to termites. She normally kept it sealed in a jar with a tight-fitting lid, but afternoon breeze was so pleasant she brought Mother out to enjoy it. This man, and his wife told their daughter not to speak to any young men, she went on. You are too good for the donkeys who live in this village, they said. You must wait until we find someone suitable. The girl obeyed. Many young men tried to court her. They brought her presents and told amusing stories. But her parents, her parents wouldn't give her permission to speak. No matter how hard the young men tried, they couldn't make the girl react. And so, one by one, they gave up and found other wives. After a time, the girl became dis discouraged. All my friends are married and have children. I think my parents don't want me to get married after all. But she was a good daughter. Whenever a new suitor showed up, she obeyed her parents and kept her mouth shut. 
Namho considered the rope she was making, her first attempts at really long strand, her first attempts at a really long strand had come apart, but she was getting the hang of it. She paused to wash the taste of bark from her, from her mouth. One day, a poor boy from another village heard about the girl. Please make me a pot of rice and cow peas, he asked his grandmother. I'm going to court the girl who won't talk to anyone. Grandmother laughed and said, what makes you think you'll succeed when everyone else fails? I've got a secret plan, he replied. If you want to taste, if you want to waste your time, it's fine with me, said grandmother. She made him a big pot of rice and cow peas, and he set off the next morning. He sat down next to a ba baobab tree near the girl's house and began stripping off the bark. After a white, after a while, the girl came out and saw him making a rope from the baobab bark. She walked past him several times, and he never looked up at her. When mealtime when meal came, he ate with one hand while still making rope with the other. She went home and told her parents, There's a strange boy making rope out of baobab fiber. I walked past him several times, but he wouldn't look up. Put on your best clothes and jewelry, suggested her father. Then see what he does. The girl put on her best clothes and jewelry. Her mother combed her hair and oiled her skin. The girl sat on a rock near the baobab tree for hours, but the boy never looked up. When dinner time came, he ate rice and cowpeas with one hand while making rope with the other. I knew it, cried the girl that night. You made me wait so long to get married. I've turned into an old woman. Hush, soothed her mother. Everyone knows you're the most beautiful girl in the village. Take him some food tomorrow and see what happens. In the morning, the girl again dressed in her best clothes. She cooked fine white sadza and spicy red relish. She presented it to the boy with a pot of water to wash his hands. To her surprise, he, only, he washed only one hand to eat with. He continued to roll fiber into rope with the other. When she reported this to, to her father, he went to the baobab tree and invited the boy to visit his house. Thank you, Baba. I would like to do that, but I'm busy right now, explained the boy. My grandmother's fields are next to a den of baboons, and she is worn out from guarding them. I am making a long rope to drag the fields closer to her hut. The girl's father was amazed that anyone was powerful enough to do that. He hurried home and told his wife to make dinner. He sent his daughter to invite the young man to stay with them. Please come, she said shyly. It was the first time she had ever spoken to a young man. The boy quickly accepted. Now he spent every night at the rich man's house. During the day, he made rope and talked to the girl. They fell in love with each other. I want to marry you. But I'm too poor to pay Rura, the boy said. You might think of Rura as dowry. That's all right, replied the girl. Just promise to pull my father's fields closer to his house as soon as you have finished with your grandmother's. The girl's father was delighted with the offer and married his daughter to the boy at once. They went off to his village and lived there very happily. They soon had many children. One day, the girl's father came to visit. Why haven't you moved my fields yet? He complained to his son-in-law. Did you really think anyone could pull a field around with a rope? His daughter laughed. That was just a trick we played so we could get married. I couldn't stand another year of not talking. Please come and see your grandchildren. The girl's father was annoyed at his clever daughter, but he liked his grandchildren, so he forgave her. Namho flexed her hands. They were getting calluses from tw from twisting so much mufuti fiber. She munched a few grasshoppers and followed them with a handful of bramble berries. I wish I could tie a rope around this island and pull it next to Zimbabwe, she told mother. Mother asked when she was going to work on the new boat. In a few days, Namho replied. I have to make a garden where the baboons won't find it. I need food for the dry season. 
Mother pointed out that sooner she got started, the sooner she could leave. To be honest, I don't know if I can copy Crocodile Guts's boat. Making a boat is easy, little disaster, said Crocodile Guts from his bench at the bottom of the lake. Use Bakua wood. It's so strong, the termites won't touch it. It's easy for you, grumbled Namho. To me, it's like carving one of Uncle Kufa's walking sticks. Uncle Kufa made them in the shapes of snakes, animals, and people and sold them at the trading post. Namho had tried to copy him, but he wound up splintering the wood instead. Take little bites. That's what termites do. It made sense. Namho knew she wasn't going to hollow out the Mukwa trunk with the panga. It was too long and anyhow too vital to her survival. She could chip away with Uncle Kufa's knife or even a sharp rock. But first, she had to plant a garden. Namho put Mother away in her jar and climbed down the lucky bean tree. She had a plan. She had been waiting until it became possible. And click on the link for chapter 24. And again, if you've liked this video um, or this audio, please give me a like. It'll help with the YouTube algorithm. Also, if you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. I typically post new, uh, new content every Monday. So in the picture that you see, there are baobab trees, which are really interesting trees. I've never seen one. Um, I've been to Africa three different times, but I've never seen one. Uh, my, uh, my, my nephew got married a few years back and he had, or I guess it was my, really my sister's, my sister's idea to have these, uh, baobab, uh, trees, um, as the centerpiece on every table. And, uh, I, I, I had to get one because this is just uh, really, really cool. And the, the video doesn't do it justice, but, um, this is like a, a wire baobab tree, um, inspiration. And so, uh, yeah, if you ever get a chance to go to Africa and see these trees, I've heard they're just amazing and beautiful and just something really cool to see. So anyway, click on the link and I'll be reading chapter 24 very soon. And I guess I have a question for you if you're still listening is, um, have you ever seen any strange tr trees? And if so, what was the name of it? Where did you see it? All right. Thanks, you guys.